a great privilege to be here, and I hope that uh, we can have a conversation really about the uh, trends and developments in international human rights. Um, this is my second visit to Indonesia, and first I first came for a conference a number of years ago, and this is a, but this is the first academic visit I'm taking, I'm having in Indonesia. I'm here as part of um, um, what we're calling a joint academic visit between three UN mandates, UN human rights mandates, which is my mandate of as UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Assembly and Association, and then also the mandate of the Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and the mandate of the Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders. And they're represented, they're not here with me themselves, but they're represented by Stefano, who works in the UN in Geneva and supporting those mandates. So this is a joint mission where we're coming to understand what's going on in Southeast Asia. Now, academic visits are, are a tool that uh, special procedures and special rapporteurs use to be able to understand what's going on in parts of the world where they may not necessarily have access or don't have enough time to conduct a full-fledged official visit. Uh, the, one of our major tools of work as special rapporteurs is what we call official visit, where we get invited, well, where we get invited by the government of a country, by after we seek, we ask them to invite us, and then they invite us and we come, and we spend between seven and, and 14 days visiting the country, talking to as many people as we can, but more importantly, talking to the government and government officials so we can understand their, their viewpoint and, what, and how they can explain certain issues that are happening in the country. But unfortunately, it's, it's quite difficult. It's, pro it's proving harder and harder to get uh, visits to, this, some, to many parts of the world. So then we devised this concept of an academic visit, which brings us to the country and we meet people. And then we learn more. And that actually does, in fact, influence our work quite dramatically because we understand things that we probably wouldn't have been able to know uh, from wherever we live and where we work from. So by coming out to the country, we meet activists, we meet journalists, we meet all kinds of people and we have a conversation and learn more. And that influences our work but and also feeds into some of the thematic reports that we do as in, in our work. So this is why we're here. But the other reason why we do academic visits is, is to remind governments that even though we are not coming for an official visit, we still have interest and we still care and we still have a, we still want to know about the country. So it's a good way in which we can remind governments that, that that their country is not forgotten and that attention will be given in that country. So one of the things that I expect after, after this academic visit is a lot of correspondence and a communication between these mandates and, and the government of Indonesia on a number of issues that have been raised with me today and will be raised again tomorrow. So that's the purpose of it all. Now, I've been asked to talk about the trends and developments in international human rights. And I think that almost at the end of 2016, I think a lot of us, uh, uh, a lot of us, especially those of us who do human rights, have been wondering what's happened to the world. Why are things looking so pessimistic in a, in, a, in a sense. Why are things not looking as good or as, as, as brave or as, uh, as forward-looking, as, as positive as we may have expected? And, and as we have gotten used to really since the Second World War ending in 1945. And I think that a lot of that pessimism though is coming from, from countries and people who live in Europe and live in the US and, and, and the Western part of the world who have had a systematic improvement in terms of human rights, a systematic improvement in terms of, of democracy. But for many people in what we call the global south, actually not, nothing, many of us are not surprised by these trends of closing space for civil society. Not many of us are surprised by, by, the, uh, by the trends of, of, of xenophobia and attacks and, and intolerance that are going on. So this is not surprising. So there are a lot of tools that have been used over the years in many countries in the south that can be useful as we look forward. I have to say that Indonesia is, uh, just looking around this part of the world, Indonesia is, is seen by many people in Southeast Asia as, as, uh, as perhaps the, the beacon today, the, the one place where there's, there's, there's reasonable freedom of expression and association and assembly, and where democracy seems to be, it seems to be moving. We, not necessarily perfectly, but at least it's moving. And democracy in the sense that uh, across Southeast Asia, there's so many 
there are so many challenges happening. But Indonesia has had now, I think, five presidents since uh, 1998, which is, which is a large number, which shows a change of power, which is a sign of democracy, a change of, of parties coming into place. Indonesia has seen growth of civil society. Indonesia has seen a number of a number a number of things that are happening, and and generally some respect for for human rights. There's a sense that they, that things are moving in in a trajectory that is uh, that is forward. But so that is how we look. So within the south the South Asia the Southeast Asia there's there's a lot of tension and worry about what's happening, and so this is some of the things that then we are looking at are the trends. I have to say though that. Um, that a lot of and this, these these negative trends are are also affecting many parts of Africa. Now I come from I come from Kenya, and in the region where I am from, we have had a series of of changes in law, where where our presidents are now changing law so they can rule for life. They don't say they rule for life, but they they remove term limits, which often means if you're an incumbent, you will never lose an election, even if you lose the vote. So you, you will never lose, you will always be appointed a president even if you lose the vote. And so they make sure they steal the election and continue <coughs> ruling and ruling. So we have, we have from where I come from, the region I come from, people have been in power since 1986. I don't know how many people were born before 1986 here in this room. So Uganda has had one president since 1986. Uh, Rwanda has had one leader since 1994. So you've got all these people who have been around for so long and are continuing. So these trends are, are negative to democracy. They're actually negative to human rights because, it, because they necessarily mean that a leader is, is engaging in, in, uh, in, uh, in corruption for sure, but also in stealing elections. Now, wh what I want to talk to you about mostly today is about a report that I, I, I issued and published with the Human Rights Council last year. Uh, this year, sorry, this year in June, and it's, it, it's called Fundamentalism's Impact on Freedom of Association and Assembly. And I use the term fundamentalism, I chose this topic uh, quite, quite deliberately, and I chose this topic because I got concerned about the rising trend of intolerance across the world, and all kinds of intolerances, and as, as we researched the topic and as we talked about it, we, we discovered, because when people talk about fundamentalism, they often think of it as religious fundamentalism. But it's not just that. We found there are at least four, four different forms of fundamentalism which, which, I, which, which I wrote about and, and which we researched. And we, we describe fundamentalism as, as uh, in fact, let me just quote from the report. I think it's much easier since many of you might be lawyers and you may, I don't want you to misquote me. Uh, <laughs> I, we, we define fundamentalism as any movements that advocates strict and literal adherence to a set of basic beliefs and principle, or principles, and that um, and that these these are based upon of a set of strict, inflexible beliefs, impervious to criticism or deviation. We use that broad definition to suggest that there are many kinds of fundamentalisms, and in the context of the report, I chose four. So one of the most interesting ones that, that, that we picked on is the concept of market fundamentalism, free market fundamentalism. And I remember when I was discussing this report with some governments, especially Western governments, they didn't like the idea that, that I could call free market capitalism as market fundamentalism. But it is indeed a form of, of fundamentalism when, when there's a belief that the free market economic policies are infallible. And you see, for those people who believe in free market capitalism, they always say the market shall set up the rules, the market shall sort out the, dif the, 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 the complexities, the difficulties, and other things. Let the market decide. And that they believe that's the best way to solve economic and social problems. So what they do then is remove regulations. That can control capitalism. And that what happens then is that we get into a situation we have got into right now in the world where 1% of the world's population control the same amount of resources as the 99% of the rest of the world. It is not tenable, it is not, is not uh, sustainable for a world to live to be so unequal, where some are so rich and others are so poor. It is not workable. But, and that then, but, but to maintain themselves in that concept of market fundamentalism, it means then that they have to abuse rights 
to be able to do, to be able to continue the market fundamentalism, to be able to do business. It means that if they want to go and exploit the gold <coughs> in, West, in Papua, they must then go and make sure that the people are silenced and they cannot protest. If the people of Papua want to stand up against them and say, this is our ancestral land, you cannot go there, then they are going to be stopped. And that is then breaching the rights. They are violating the rights of people so that they can make money, so they can make profits. It means then that if you if you that they can destroy environment, they can destroy lakes and rivers across the world, and that they can even and worst about it is that they can make sure they pay people peanuts, just pay more than you can live on, so they can make bigger and bigger profits. So all those are violations of rights, and so when people try and organize because that's what people do when they feel they're oppressed, they organize to fight back, to find a way to address their concerns, then those assemblies, those associations are broken up. So we, so one of the things I, I thought was important is to, is to actually put it out quite clearly that, that I'm not saying at all that, that, that market, uh, that, that capitalism is bad, I'm not saying it's good either, but I'm saying simply that if you follow an approach that says capitalism alone is the most important thing, Workers' rights don't count, people's rights don't count, environmental rights don't count, um, uh, indigenous people's rights don't count, then you are, you are pushing market fundamentalism. And that, that was interesting in terms of the, of the response I got from states, because it was basically the Western states that found that unacceptable. Because again, they are awful. There's also a whole range of the fact that the Western world is consuming much more than the rest of the world put together. They are responsible for a lot of exploitation that goes on in the world. The second fundamentalism that I put out there is what we call political fundamentalism. And political fundamentalism is basically saying that a political ideology, a political party, or leader is the only one allowed to have a view. So it's one view over ever others. And the best example of that, of course, is North Korea. And where North Korea allows only one party, the Communist Party, and no one else is allowed to have it. And of course, when you have a monopoly of power, a monopoly of ideology, a monopoly of authority, then you're going to definitely violate rights of all of them. Because anybody who opposes you, anybody who criticizes you, is then bound to be uh, to lose their rights about to be violated and, 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 and abused. So I think that one's a very clear one. The third one was what we call cultural and, nas and national and na nationalistic fundamentalisms. And again, this one is more about, about uh, beliefs that certain people and cultures or languages are superior to others. And, you f and, again, and maybe the best example there is, is in India with, with the Dalits, where you have the Dalits who are the, the, the lowest caste possible, who are treated as non-people. Or you also have it as well with people in Tibet, in China, where the Chinese are trying to, in a sense, even move them out of their, of, of their, of their homelands. And, you've got, and that's, that's the cultural and nationalistic fundamentalism, where one group feels superior. It's also the root of the, of the famous xenophobia we are seeing now in Europe, where Europeans are beginning to think that being European means being white, means being a Christian, means a certain form of, of race, and it isn't, because the world has moved beyond that. So there's a whole element around that that, that, is, that is linked to, to a sense of cultural fundamentalism. The last one that I picked up was what we then called religious fundamentalism, and I think that might have some, 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 uh, some focus here in this country, which, is, which has got a lot of different cultures and different religions. And the idea here is that, is that, uh, is that they're, again, there's they're strict, they're strict and literal adherence to a particular set of religious beliefs that also says that one belief is right and the rest are wrong. And what we're arguing in this, in this report is that, look, it doesn't matter what people believe. It doesn't matter how people look. That we have to respect each other and be tolerant of the other. As long as it's not hurting you. And that's the fundamental part of human rights. Human rights has always been about tolerance. Human rights has been, always been about pluralism. That we have many, many ideas out there. Some are wrong, some are right, but we let you hold them. Human rights is the, is the, is the, uh, is the notion that you can be stupid in your belief. And that's OK. It's okay to be stupid. It's okay to be wrong. That's okay. As long as you don't affect and force others to, to be like you. 
So if you want to be stupid in your in your culture, that's your problem. No one should bother you as long as you're not affecting other people. And that's the center of human rights. That human rights is about dignity. That each of us has to have the dignity of in our lives, in all aspects of our lives. You know, there's, there was for a long time in human rights there was this divide, which still exists in some form, between what they call civil and political rights and cultural and economic rights. But the, when you bring them together, it talks. It's really about dignity. That each of us has has the right to dignity in terms of where we live, how we live, and how we think. That nobody has a right to tell me how to think, how to believe, how to pray, and how to love. I alone should make my choice about how I love. As long as I'm not affecting anybody else, nobody should care. Because if I love another woman who happens to do that's my business. If I love a man, it's my business. Why should anybody care? Who am I hurting? Nobody. And that's the basic framework of human rights. It's about saying, you have your rights to live your life, I have my rights to live my life. Who I love is nobody's business. Not the state, not my neighbors, not my fathers, not my mothers. It's my business. How I pray or don't pray is my business. You may think, the Christians think that if I don't pray, I'll go to hell. So let me go to hell after I die. It's okay. Not your business if I go to hell or heaven. It's my business. It's my business. So I, and I think it's so important here at this point in our lives that, that we accept that we are not all going to be the same. We accept that we are not all going to think the same. And that if we start thinking the same, this world will die out. It will collapse. Because it's from the diversity of ideas, it's from the diversity of different thinkings and differences in itself that spur us to be better. So yes, I can come and try and convince you to think like me. But if you don't agree, I should respect that. And that for me right now is one of the most, most important global challenge that exists. And it's not just in Asia or Africa or Latin America. In the West right now, it's a big issue. Because we have a person like Trump who's been, who's been saying very intolerant things about all sorts of people. About homosexuals, about, well, he hasn't said much about homosexuals, so I'll give him that, against Muslims, against refugees. He said really nasty things. So we, we must, somebody, some place in the world must start being better than what is there. And Indonesia today has shown, at least in this region, that it has been improving. I want to challenge you all as Indonesians to be the leaders, not just of the region, but of the world in terms of being the tolerant, pluralistic people. The ones who will accept people for who they are and what they are, as long as they're not hurting anybody's rights, as long as they're not stepping on anybody's toes. And, as, and people who will care for those who are marginalized and oppressed in this country. The Papuans have been having a long struggle and it's important that it's owned now by as many people in Indonesia as, 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 as possible. It's a struggle that hasn't come out internationally properly. But they, read, they have just got a report here from, from a group that looking at West Papua in 2015. I met the Papuans this afternoon. And I must say I don't know enough about it. But I do know that when people are, are marginalized the way, the way it seems, there's, there's a problem. There's a problem. And it's a problem that Indonesian must own. And that that problem will be best solved when Indonesians take ownership of that problem and start working to resolve it. Then the rest of the world can come in and support it. Because if one part of Indonesia feels unfree, if one part of Indonesia feels that it's, it's discriminated against, if one part of Indonesia feels that when they try and organize a protest, they are treated differently than other people in Indonesia, then the whole of Indonesia cannot be free. Cannot be free. And if they can do it to Papuans, they will ne I can tell you, and they'll move it to play from one place to another. That's how oppression works. We, we succeed in one place, let's go to the next one, let's go to the next one. Indonesia had had its moments of, of dictatorship that the whole world knew. Indonesians stood up against all very, very high odds and succeeded. The world looks up to you all as Indonesians to lead us again in, in becoming a freer, more, more pluralistic, more tolerant nation. You can do it. We have confidence you can. This is your country. 
And this is, right now, the world is looking for a country, a nation <coughs> to take leadership. <coughs> Will it be Indonesia? Thank you very much. <coughs>